And good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the California Small Farm Conference. My name is Evan Wig. I'm with Community Alliance of Family Farmers, uh, and we're very excited to have you here uh, for another workshop. So today we're going to be digging into uh, wine growing or uh, vineyards on a small scale. Uh, we've got a great uh, speaker here today, Christopher Chen, and um, I just want to encourage everybody to um, use our chat feature. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button that says chat. I encourage you to use that to introduce yourselves, share resources, ask questions, um, and join the conversation about today's topic. I um, want to big, give a big shout out to our sponsors and, of course, all of our speakers who are making this year's event possible. Um, and all of you for showing up um, here on a Monday morning to talk about vineyards. So uh, thank you so much. And with that, I will pass the uh, mic over here to, to Christopher and uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Evan. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Happy uh, Monday. Let me share my slides real quick. So yeah, good morning. Uh, I am Chris Chen. I am the UC Cooperative Extension Vineyard Systems Advisor for the North Coast. So I cover Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake Counties. Uh, and thanks for attending this session. We're going to talk about small vineyard management, how to manage small vineyards, and the key components of um, small vineyard management that are fundamental to farming grapes. Uh, I, I would also like you to encourage you to use the chat if you want to. Uh, it's a very useful way to talk. I won't be looking at it very much, but uh, if I do get a chance to look at it, I can uh, look at a few questions that pop up here and there. Okay, let's get going. So first off, in terms of vineyard management, I think we should talk about vineyard health and what vineyard health is, uh, because it's a very important concept to make sure that we get our grapes uh, off of the vine. So what is just health in general? Um, health for vineyards, we defined health as the state of being free from illness or injury. Uh, this is kind of how we define it as, as people as well. If you're healthy, you're doing well, you're not worried about this or that going wrong with your body. We think about that with the grapevines. Um, unfortunately, you know, as living biological creatures, there's really no way to be totally free of illness or injury. Um, we always are dealing with something or another. And if we're not, we're doing really good. Uh, but with grapevines, you know, they're out there 20, 30 years at least. So we have to consider, you know, what could go wrong and how we avoid those things. And the next best, best option of just, you know, hoping that you have a really healthy vineyard is we're going to manage the vineyard to keep illness or injury to a minimum. This is really important. Uh, if we don't do that, then um, we're going to have lots of problems going forward. So vineyard health, the term health as defined previously, directly impacts our, our vineyard's function um, the and the key components of vine physiology. So the, the main components we're concerned with, with vine health and its functionality are photosynthesis, right? Which all plants do, most plants do actually, not all plants, uh, which provides carbohydrates to the plant through taking in sunlight and converting it into sugars. We have vascular system function, which is very important that, you know, if photosynthesis is the food source for the grapevine, then the vascular system function is the highway where it gets its water and nutrients from. Uh, our reproductive efficacy, which is you know, important to the grapevine itself, but also probably more important to us because that's why we're planting them. Um, that's what leads to good yields and high quality fruit. And then physical support, which we provide in the form of trellising um, and, and training. One issue with this, you know, view of vineyard health is that it is subject to environmental changes and environmental responses. Uh, and our changing climates are affecting those physiological factors that impact vine health. So temperature is a big one. I used, had an advisor in graduate school that used to say, if you're managing a vineyard, there's only three things you really need to think about. And they're temperature, temperature, and temperature. Uh, and it's kind of true. You, it's very important. Uh, temperatures really impact how much the, the grape grows, how well it sets fruit, uh, how well it does it next year. Temperatures are very important and they, they impact all aspects of the vine health. Similarly, precipitation or water availability also affects all aspects of vine health. Um, I put precipitation because I think my mind was on the massive rains we've had for the past few weeks, uh, but this also includes irrigation, right? We also have an issue or a concern with extreme weather events becoming more frequent and more severe. 
These are things like heat waves, wildfires, uh, late frost events in late spring or early fall. Uh, impact the, these events really impact photosynthesis and reproduction, and they're more impactful in places that don't usually experience them. So, for instance, where I work, where I live, uh, on the north coast, heat waves are much more impactful than they are in the San Joaquin Valley or Central Valley of California, and that's because we don't have the same infrastructure and grapevine cultivars that are used to or adapted to extreme heat events. So, we when we get hit with them, they're pretty impactful. Uh, similarly, frost events are more impactful in places that don't typically experience frost events in spring uh, or in fall. And uh, that happened a couple years ago where we got a huge frost event that went all the way down to like Bakersfield, uh, which they don't have the infrastructure to deal with those frost events like we do because we expect them. So extreme weather events are happening more often and they affect vineyard health in a very acute sense. Um, and then we have pests and diseases, which I will talk about in a bit, but they directly limit vine health uh, and vine function. And there, sometimes these impacts are really easy to spot. Uh, these are all photos I took myself or one of my colleagues took between 2016 and now. Uh, and these are all examples of extreme events that occurred. So we had the flooding last year, um, this, this vineyard in the top left, that actually had tree trunks in the trellis system because the water was so high that it floated tree trunks that had fallen into the trellis system. Um, we have fires, obviously this was in, the middle picture was in Napa in 2016 or 2017. Um, more flooding, we get snow now, which is at least up here, which is strange uh, and not, not a small amount of snow, quite a bit of snow. Um, that was a rare one-off event people say, but I have a feeling it might occur more and then of course heat. Uh, the the berries themselves can get torched uh, just on the side that they're exposed to the sun but we also get the environmental temperatures which radiate heat at night later on and don't allow the grapes to cool off in the evening. Um, this is the bottom right image is the vineyard floor in Napa uh, one year and that is about 150 degrees Fahrenheit um, and that's at you know like 2 p.m. So this didn't cool off all night long. We had temperatures around 80 degrees all night long. So they're happening and you can see them. But when we're exploring how these climate change impacts occur in vineyards, we should take note of both the direct and the indirect impacts and consequences of climate change. Um, direct impacts are relatively apparent. Higher temperatures, you know, variable or inconsistent water resources and so on, whereas Indirect impacts can lead to more difficult, can be more difficult to identify. Uh, these are like increased soil salinization, loss of laborers because it's too hot to work, uh, changes in activity of invertebrate pests, stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, more extreme weather events, which could be argued as both a direct and indirect impact. So, a question for you all here, and something that I would like you to at least think about. What are some examples that you can think of of direct and indirect impacts of climate change on our cropping systems? And bonus if it's specific to grapevines, because that's all I work with. As I go through the presentation, please feel free to write down a few in the chat. Uh, maybe it, you can discuss amongst yourselves whether these are direct or indirect. And if you plan to come to my workshop at Shone Farm, bring them with you. Write them down, bring them with you, and we can talk about them in the field. Uh, let's get into more small vineyard management and maintenance, maybe stop talking about climate change a bit, and just kind of focus on the essentials that we need to think about when we're managing a vineyard. Okay, so there are some primary objectives that we have to think about when we are managing a vineyard, uh, and these are relatively basic. They include things like increasing our yield and improving the fruit quality of our grapes. Um, increasing the lifespan of our vineyards. So replanting a vineyard is not cheap. If we can make it last and produce well, you know, high quality fruit at high yields for longer, we're going to do better in the long run. Um, conserving or utilizing resources effectively. You know, resources are limited no matter what you're looking at. So we have to use them effectively. Conserving the health of the vineyard and the surrounding sites. Uh, surrounding sites being a big one too. We don't want to paint the neighbor's field with excess nitrogen 
uh, or we don't want to hurt the water supply. Workers' safety and health and well-being are very important as well. This keeps people wanting to work in your vineyard. Um, profit for sustainable operations. If you don't make enough money to continue your operation, it's not going to not going to keep going, unfortunately, no matter how good your practices are. Uh, and limiting our necessary inputs. So if we need less to grow the same amount, we don't have to think about it as much. Uh, and how you rank these in order of importance will impact your, your methods for management and what you put up first in terms of priority. And I did get a question, can we get copies of the presentation? And yes, you can. Um, at the end of my slides, there are uh, directions on how to get those, those copies. Okay, the one thing that we can impact and it's in some ways are environmental conditions on site and they are the most impactful input into vineyard health and success. The vine itself is important to manage, uh, but environmental conditions impact how the vine grows, reproduces and so on. And the environmental conditions that we can, we can look at are divided between biotic being living inputs or abiotic being inorganic inputs. And we can modify our vine health by managing conditions on site and the vines themselves. And we'll talk about each of these a little bit. <clears throat> so we're gonna split the management portion into two here, managing the grapevine and managing the site. So in terms of managing the vine, uh, there are some key practices that should be done to maintain the health and productivity of a grapevine. Uh, we're gonna go through these now, but I also have more information and YouTube videos on my UCCE website if you want more information, this is just kind of a brief overview of this. So trellising and training, uh, it's kind of how we sculpt the vine. Uh, and we do that based on the conditions at a given site. Uh, that includes how much canopy we leave or how tall the vines are allowed to grow. Um, and those may be influenced by sun exposure or um, wind instance at the site. Trellising, is different from training, right? So trellising is just the support system for the vine, and this should be matched to both the potential of the site and the vine's vigor. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is your soil really fertile? Well, then you probably will have bigger grapevines, so you probably want a bigger trellis system. And, and the vine's vigor changes based on the variety or how much inputs you give it. So if you have Sauvignon Blanc, this is the classic example of a gigantic grapevine. I, I call it green monster because every part of it is green and it grows out of control if not managed properly uh, versus something like Petit Verdot, which is typically very small and easy to manage. Uh, but this means a bigger trellis system for a more vigorous vine or a site with high soil fertility and a smaller trellis system for the inverse. Pruning is also very important. I would like actually to make a quick note on um, trellising systems. There are many trellising systems and we tend to stick to a handful of them. I think it's very important to, if you're planning to plant a vineyard or planning to replant the vineyard, to look at the options for trellising systems. Um, they're going to impact how you manage the vine. They're also going to impact uh, how the vine grows into the future. So quad systems have four cordons. There's um, bilateral systems. There's head train systems. There's a lot of systems that I don't have time to go over with you today. Uh, but that's easily searchable and something that if you have questions about, you can always email me. Pruning is, again, very important. Uh, it's an essential practice with few options, and we kind of stick to two main styles of pruning. There's spur pruning and cane pruning. Um, so spur pruning is what you see most of the time. It's when we leave uh, just a, an established growing region. Uh, and that region will always be in the specific part of the grapevine that we want to grow next year. Uh, it's got its benefits. E each of these have their benefits for certain situations. Burr pruning is great for ease of management, and it can be done with little training, and it can be accomplished quickly. So if you don't know what you're doing that well, spur pruning is very easy to learn and very easy to do right. Um, cane pruning, however, which is our other big method of pruning, requires more experience and skill uh, but it can also also serve to decrease the risk of infection by fungal pathogens in the grapevine. And that's because we're, with cane pruning, we are removing more of the permanent tissue. So with cane pruning, we don't have these cordons any longer. We just have shoot, new shoots each year that serve as the cordons. So all this tissue is no longer available uh, for infection. 
And that is really important in terms, especially for fungal pathogens, because fungal pathogens grow very slowly. So if you remove more host material, uh, then it's less likely to grow into the areas where you want your fruit to be. So cane pruning is more difficult because you have to actually pick out the structure of the vine year to year, uh, but it can help a lot. In both cases, pruning should be done, for us at least, in late winter, uh, and should be timed to fall between major rain events. And that's to avoid one early bud break, because the later we prune, the later the grapevine starts growing in spring. So if we have a spring frost, we can avoid that by pruning a little bit later. Um, the timing between rain events really is for limiting fungal spore infection. So if we prune during a rain event, fungal spores require free water to move. Um, if we're pruning and it rains the next day, there's an open wound, the fungal spores can get in there. Okay. Another necessary component is canopy management. Uh, vines need adequate airflow and light penetration to limit the growth of fungal pathogens and insect pests within the canopy. Think of it kind of like a musty shower room with poor ventilation compared to a well-lit shower room with good airflow. One of those is much less likely to grow dangerous molds and mildews than the other. Uh, and it's the same with grapevine canopies. If we change the amount of light and air that flow through the canopy, uh, the more light and air that get to the fruit zone, the less likely we're going to have those fungal diseases uh, crop up during the growing season. Um, you could say they are cleaned up, but you can say that they have good airflow and light penetration, but generally they just need to be exposed and our grapes won't even ripen very well if they don't have that sun exposure. Now this image I would like to point out is too much uh, exposure. This would lead to sunburn, but um, this was the best picture I had to really drive home the example. So yeah, there's pretty much you just wanna remove about this much right around the fruit zone and the rest of it you can take lightly. And then of course there's vine nutrition. Vines need nutrients. Um, potassium alone, we have removed three pounds of potassium per ton of fruit uh, during harvest and that's got to be replaced at some point on the site that typically in vineyards that's replaced every two to three years. Um, sometimes every year, but potassium is actually quite dangerous to replace every year because it results in soil hard panning if applied too much uh, at too high quantities. So we, we tend to stagger application rates of potassium uh, if possible. But this is true for most nutrients that vines require. Some nutrients may also just be unavailable uh, because they're so tightly bound to the soil particles or they're trapped within soil aggregates and they're inaccessible to the roots of the grape or the mycorrhizae that are associated with the grapevine roots. Um, so we do have to replace almost every nutrient of the grapevine. Uh, and I'll talk more about soil nutrients in a minute. Um, to fix this, we typically fertilize and we do so based on whether the nutrient we need to apply is a macronutrient or a micronutrient. A macronutrient is needed in much higher quantities, uh, up to a magnitude more than a micronutrient. Uh, and we often apply macronutrients in a solid or a liquid form um, to the root zone of the grapevines, and we kind of water them in. So it's it's not a direct application. It's kind of here, grapevine, here's the food, take it up when you can. Uh, and the micronutrients are often applied as foliar sprays directly to the grapevine, and they absorb them directly. And this increases the efficacy of the uh, utilization of those nutrients. However, because we can only do this because the vines need only very little amounts of micronutrients. If they needed a lot, it would be difficult to spray on enough for them to absorb it. Um, but to see what we need and what we need to fertilize with, we should be testing both the plant and the soil for nutrient concentrations before deciding on any form of fertilizer, whether it's synthetic or compost, uh, to apply it on site. Okay. Those are the basics of managing the grapevine. Now we're gonna talk about managing the site itself, which can be very important as well. And I will get to your questions if I have time at the end. Um, soil health, soil health is a big term. Uh, it's used, used a lot. Uh, it's most of the control we have over the site is in the soil. And one term that gets thrown out a lot is soil health. Uh, it's one of the most complex terms that we can think of, and soil in general are one of the most complex environmental factors that we can influence directly. 
Soil health can refer to any of the measures of soil that we use in agriculture, uh, whether that's soil structure, so, uh, organic carbon content, chemical properties, nutrients, and so on. Um, however, our soils are one of the most impactful parameters on our grapevines, so we can look at all these parameters here and see which ones can we actually control. And we can, <laughs> we can modify most of these uh, with enough effort. If we don't have the resources to do it, then we are going to be stuck with what we have. Uh, a great example of that is soil texture. Soil texture is the defined as the ratio between sand, silt, and clay, which are different soil particle sizes. Um, it's really hard to change soil te texture. The general idea is that you need to have about 50% of the volume of the given soil to change the texture. So if I wanted to increase my soil to a sandy loam, sandy clay loam rather than a silty clay loam, I would need 50% of my inputs in the soil by weight to be sand, basically. So it's, it's economically impossible to do in most cases, um, unless you're doing this in a planter box, uh, but in the field, it's very difficult. However, we can change things like soil structure, which is aggregation. <clears throat> so organic carbon by adding compost and manure, uh, chemical properties, this has to do with uh, pH of the soil mostly, and then nutrients through um, application of fertilizer. And I, I encourage you if there's, I saw there's two talks on soil health during this conference to, to attend those if you're signed up for them. Oh. So when we're talking about soil nutrition, that's one of the aspects of soil health and one that we tend to focus a lot on in agriculture. Uh, many, many nutrients are lost or removed from vineyards each year. And that could be through harvest, like in our case with potassium. Uh, leaching. So if we have too much rain, any nutrients that are highly mobile or can move very easily in the soil are, can be just flushed down past where the roots can reach them, uh, or erosion where they run off the top instead. And this is true for all of our, well, most of our plant essential nutrients, where some are more mobile than others, some are more available to plants than others. And the, the key one that is really unavailable and immobile, it won't move very much is phosphorus. Phosphorus tends to bind very tightly to soil. Um, and if you do a soil test, one soil test may not tell you exactly how much phosphorus is in the site because it might be bound to an aggr a soil aggregate or it may be distributed improperly or heterogeneously throughout the vineyard. So phosphorus is a great example of one of those nutrients that we have to replace, but we don't really know how much is gonna be available in the long run to the grape. So we have to keep doing these nutrient tests in our soil every few years to identify excess or deficient elements in the site. Um, these are very useful and I recommend any agricultural system, especially uh, annual crops, do soil tests regularly just really to find out what are we missing and what do we have to replace, but also comparing the soil nutrient values to those of your grapevine nutrient tests because there are incongruities between what's in the soil and what the grapevine can take up. So sometimes you'll have plenty of magnesium in the soil uh, and the grapevine has more calcium than magnesium in it, that could be due to uh, active transport. So it could differentially uh, look for and uptake calcium, even though there's more magnesium in the soil. Uh, and that could lead to a deficiency in magnesium. That's a rare case, but it could happen. Um, and that generally what's in the soil doesn't directly translate to what the grapevine is getting. So comparing them really helps. <clears throat> And then abiotic stress management is another big one. So the other factors that I've been talking about are really focused on maintaining a, a given location based on soil. Now we're gonna talk kind of a little bit about what's gonna happen with the atmosphere and the environment, um, the conditions around the grapevine that aren't, that are above ground. So frost, frost is a big one. Spring and fall frost are becoming more frequent um, and they can be more devastating. They can damage any fruit or any green tissues. So fall frost typically occurs before harvest. Uh, and if that's the case, the grapevines get frozen and they are no longer usable. Um, the grapes aren't usable. Spring frost can occur right after bud break and kill off any of the new shoots that are going to produce your fruit. So in both cases, very bad. We have sun exposure, which is another big one. Um, that can lead to berry shrivel, like the image here. And that degrades phenolic compounds, which are necessary for winemaking. Uh, as you can see, this is highly degraded. 
just on the side that was exposed to the sun. So it's sun exposure. Uh, heat mitigation is also important. This can decrease the vine's water use efficiency. It can basically make the vine thirsty. Uh, and if you don't have the available water, you know, this year and last year, we probably will have enough water to uh, manage any water need of the grapevine. But there are plenty of years in California where we don't have enough water to really meet that vine water demand. Um, so we need to see how we can mitigate heat in the vineyard to prevent water loss. Uh, and then droughts are very closely related to that, where we li it limits vine growth uh, and requires water to reverse the impacts of the drought in the short term and in the long term. Um, but yeah, the, these are some of the main factors of abiotic stress management. So how do we do some of these? Frost protection is a relatively straightforward one. Um, frost risk can increase by height off of the ground. So the higher you are off the ground, the colder it is at night because the soil is not radiating heat as closely to the source. So you think about the urban island effect. Um, buildings absorb heat during the day and release them at night. That's why our cities are warmer than our countrysides. Uh, that happens in vineyards too. So if you have a bare soil, that absorbs a lot of heat. And at night, it reflects a lot of heat. Uh, but if you're, the vine is far away from that, it doesn't get a huge benefit of that, that reflected heat. Um, Trellis height can decrease phosphorus, so the shorter you are, sometimes the better. Um, vegetative cover can also reduce soil heat absorption. So if you have cover crops, they don't allow as much sunlight to hit the soil top, uh, so they don't get as warm, so you don't get as much radiation overnight. Um, wet, compacted soils also help retain heat, so water is a really good uh, transmitter, ret retention agent of, of temperature, of heat. Uh, so you think about, what I think about when I think about this is the closer you are to a lake or an ocean, the more heat um, comes into the water and then is radiated from the water at night, but the temperature swings are less than from solid objects like buildings, soils. Uh, so the, the more water that's in a soil or in a grapevine, the less likely you're going to get frost damage. Um, and then the way we reduce frost risk are twofold. There's two methods. So there's water protection and there's wind turbulence. For, for water protection or frost irrigation protection, what we do is we spray water on the grapevines overnight for as long as there are freezing temperatures. And the process of water freezing releases heat. So it keeps the berry temperatures just above freezing. So we don't get, or the leaf temperatures just above freezing. So we don't actually get frost damage. However, this is a huge use of water. Uh, it can increase your water use in a single vineyard by 20 to 30 percent easily for just the few nights that you have that that risk of of freezing. The other way we do it is wind turbulence or these wind machines you see everywhere that can be very noisy. The new ones are more quiet, luckily. Uh, but these wind machines everywhere, what they do is they mix the air. So when we have a temperature inversion, we have hot air above and cold air below. So cold air near the grapevines. And because these are so tall, they can mix that air and make it kind of a median temperature. So we get less risk of frost. But this only works in areas where we have temperature inversions. Um, that doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, some places don't ever get temperature inversions. So we have to actually look to see where they're going to work before we install them. For mitigating heat and solar radiation, uh, we have several methods. Um, solar radiation and excess heat really do lead to degradation of compounds. Uh, they are also very important for building those compounds, um, but degradation occurs pretty rapidly when after they hit maturity. So we can use larger canopies to naturally shade our grapes. Um, a lot of heat comes from direct solar radiation. So if we can shade from sunlight, then we have less chance of damage from, from solar radiation and heat accumulation. But we can also use artificial shading means. So artificial shading can be used with the forms of shade nets, which I've done research on and is this image here, um, or shade films. Uh, there are tarps that you can use. The only issue with these is that they're very difficult to put up and take down over time. Uh -huh. But if you're interested in shading, the black shade nets with 40% transmittance are the best for grapevines. And then irrigation scheduling is also very important. Vineyards between use between 0.6 to 1.2 acre feet of water per year per acre. Um, that's somewhere around 200 to 400,000 gallons of water per acre. Uh, and this is actually one of the lower water demands for perennial crops. So there are some crops that use triple this. 
um, that we've grown in the North Coast before. So vines are actually relatively water efficient, uh, and that has partially to do with their vascular system and that they are grapevines. Um, they grow, to, you know, naturally they grow in an area where they have to climb trees uh, to get sunlight. So they tend not to use too much water uh, as they're growing compared to trees. Irrigation amounts for vineyards, we base those off of a reference evapotranspiration, which is uh, basically how much water is lost from an alfalfa field or a grass field. And we convert that value uh, with a crop coefficient, which is specific to the crop we're using. So that could be grapevines, it could be pears, it could be walnuts. Uh, and that gives us basically how much water the site is using for both evaporation and plant transpiration for a given part of the year. And it changes throughout the summer. So middle of summer, it's going to be a lot higher than, it's, than the beginning of spring. Um, with vineyards, we have what are called deficit irrigation strategies. And this is not only to preserve water resources, but also to improve the compounds, the phenolic compound uh, accumulation in the fruit and the, the style of compound or, or the, yeah. So deficit irrigation replaces less water in the field than is lost in a given period, which stresses out the grapevine. Regulated deficit irrigation is the most common style of deficit irrigation, which means we change it based on the time of year and the, the uh, developmental stage of the grapevine during that time of year. Uh, and what that does is it changes how much and what format of phenolic compound is produced in the fruit and then how quickly it's degraded once the fruit hits maturity. Uh, it's a very common practice. I have a spreadsheet, again, on my website that will show you exactly how to do it. Uh, you just got to put in the right numbers on, I think, four columns, and it's a huge spreadsheet, so it'll give you the right values. But when we're looking at these methods, we're looking at standard irrigation being, that I, I couldn't get the right curve on PowerPoint here, but generally this would be flat, flat, and then it would curve down a little bit at the end. So we're just irrigating a given amount um, to replace what's lost in the vineyard, and it's typically higher in summer. With deficit irrigation, we're responding to the period of time uh, that, or the phenological stage and develop developmental stage of the grapevine, and we're reducing water inputs as the berries are forming and as they hit veraison, which is the color shift period. Um, and then our goal really is to improve these parameters through a stress-related mean, which is water here. So as we reduce the water, the sugar accumulation goes up, our color compound, which is anthocyanin accumulation goes up, the hydroxylation pattern of anthocyanins change, and the flavor compounds change too, so our tannins um, and our flavanols. So this, this is a very common practice, and if you own or manage a vineyard, I recommend trying it out if you haven't before. Um, it tends to produce fruit that winemakers prefer, uh, similar to like dry farming does. Uh, it changes the compounds in a very positive way. It also changes the ratios of sugar to acids as well. Okay, so I'm going to look at a couple questions real quick. Uh, can you clarify again why it's not recommended to reapply potassium each year, but rather every few years? Yes. So I worked in a vineyard uh, at, in Davis, at UC Davis, where we had potassium deficiency in our grapevines. And our vineyard manager applied potassium through the irrigation system every year. And what that does is actually makes the soil become unaggregated. It's called deflocculation. Uh, and Potassium only has one positive charge on it, so it binds around a bunch of clay particles, and that prevents the clay particles from binding to each other. Where when you have a compound that has a two, like two positive charges, like calcium, um, that will bind to two different clay particles, and it'll make a dirt clod basically over time. So what what it's what's the potassium is doing here is it's preventing the clay particles from binding to each other, and you're basically you think of like a jar of sugar all that sugar just settles down into kind of a solid chunk. That's what's happening in the field. So the, the clay layers and the soil layers aren't binding into aggregates with pore space. They're, bind, they're not binding at all. And they're just becoming this solid pan of clay particles with potassium in them. 
Um, if you apply potassium every year in high quantities, you get that and you end up with a soil that doesn't let any water in. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Um, let me see one more and then I'll keep going. Uh, how many days should the vines have to dry after the cut? That's that's a pretty good question. Um, so the general consensus, and this is very hard, right? Because we want to prune during winter is two weeks before the next rain event and two weeks after the previous rain event. Um, that is ideal timing uh, where we don't have any free water in the vineyard, uh, except for like morning dew, which doesn't move very much. Uh, splashing is really, really negative for spore distribution. Um, so typically two weeks before the next rain, two weeks after the last rain, but a lot of people do it a few days uh, before and after, but we do see a lot of fungal infections and grapevines in, in wetter regions like the North Coast. Okay, so I'm going to keep going and I'll answer some more questions later. So primary pests and diseases of grapevines. So the, if we're talking about pests and diseases, we can divide them into kind of three different groups, microbial, animal, and plants. Uh, so microbial being fungal, viral, and bacterial, and animal being invertebrates, vertebrates. Um, plants, those are just weeds. We call those weeds. So I'm going to go through a few of each of these, and I think it's important to know these ones. Uh, they're the most common, and uh, you should just know what to look for. So fungal trunk diseases are really important and currently incurable. So if you get them, uh, the grapevine will survive for a while, but eventually will have to be replaced sooner than it would have if you didn't get them. And again, this has to do with the rain and the spore distribution. So the two big ones uh, for fungal trunk diseases are Utypa and Etska, and they're very hard to tell apart in the field, but they have very similar impacts. So it's not incredibly important to tell them apart in the field. Um, the symptoms first start appearing five to seven years after it was infected. So that could, if it came infected already, then that's five to seven years after it was planted in the field. Uh, if it gets infected later by pruning too late and getting spore uh, infiltration, then that's five to seven years after that. And that's because these fungal pathogens grow very slowly. Um, they are, they produce wedge shaped cankers in the wood, which I believe I have a picture of later. Uh, and then they end up killing back spurs, shoots, uh, and those dead points also allow spores to enter through, but usually spores enter through pruning wounds. Uh, and it can be difficult to identify until you see these symptoms here. And then it's too late, you have to remediate or replace your vine. You can't manage these really after the fact. Uh, people are working on that, uh, especially at UC Davis. But if you prune later at, or you prune twice, so you give, you prune back less wood uh, the first time, or more, you, you, you leave more wood the first pruning session, and the second pruning session, you cut back to a two bud spur or back to a cane. Um, that's called double pruning. This prevents those rain events from really uh, getting, causing issues. Um, you wanna clean your equipment with a solution of one, one to 10 bleach um, between rows or be even between vines if you want to, and then remove any infected wood. That's really important. Um, you also want to paint wounds, especially large pruning wounds with some kind of protectant. And there's many out there, but my favorite are the biological ones that typically are based on trichoderma, uh, which colonizes the wound before um, any detrimental fungal spores can get in there. But you need a license to do that. Mildews and rots are also important. So downy mildew is a big one, but not in California. It requires warm and wet periods during the growing season to reproduce. Um, we get limited rainfall in summer, so we don't see this often. And if we do see it, it's, it doesn't really spread much. So don't worry too much about downy mildew. The one you should worry about is powdery mildew, which uh, is strange and is one of the only fungal diseases that doesn't require free water um, to germinate, uh, but it does spread by free water. So the, it appears first on leaves as these chlorotic spots on the upper leaf surface that look kind of circular. Uh, and then it slowly spreads its mycelium. So it looks like powdered sugar on the top of a grapevine. And this is why we call it powdery mildew. And you can fix this uh, relatively easily. Unlike the trunk diseases, you can get rid of powdery mildew by spraying um, sulfurs or other fungicides on site. Um, there's organic and synthetic versions of control methods, but you have to be on top of it. And typically it's 
uh, early spring to midsummer that you have to worry about it until the berries hit a certain size and they can no longer keep their mycelial network together. Bunch rot is also very common. Um, there's multiple kinds of bunch rot, but this typically occurs in varieties that have really dense clusters, clus grapes that are really packed in there um, and can be worsened when the canopy or the cluster is too dense. So even if the canopy is too dense, you get a better humid environment. You get a musty shower room for these things to grow. And you can't really find these sometimes because they're in the middle of the cluster. So how do you manage mildews and bunch rot? You have to keep things dry. Um, the best thing to do is to do leaf removal, like I showed you earlier, canopy management. This, is, this results in 50% control of the disease already for mildews and bunch rot. Um, you can also do preventative fungicides. Copper is another one that works relatively well for this. Uh, or micronized spray for sulfur application or oil should be applied prior to other fungicides. Um, and we do have a powdery mildew risk assessment index and spray index at the UC ANR or UC Cooperative Extension IPM website, which is, you can Google that. Uh, it'll tell you when you're at risk for powdery mildew and when you should spray. Okay, so viral and bacterial diseases. I'm only gonna go through a handful here, but red blotch is a big one. Um, red blotch was identified in 2008. Before that, it, no one knew it existed. Uh, it limits sugar accumulation in the fruits. And uh, the symptoms are very easy to spot in red grapes, a little harder in white grapes because they don't turn red. Uh, the, both the leaves and the veins of, of the leaf itself, so the laminal tissue and the leaf, the veins will turn red uh, and kind of in a blotchy pattern, thus the name red blotch. Uh, it can also delay ripening, it can decrease sugar accumulation, and eventually if, it's if sugars don't accumulate by harvest, it results in rot, which would be or I guess you just couldn't harvest it because nobody would want it. Uh, so this is very problematic and very pervasive in almost all of California now. Uh, it's vectored by an insect called three-cornered alfalfa hoppers, um, but it spreads quite a bit. So watch out for this one, which looks very similar to leaf roll. And leaf roll it has very similar issues. So this is a complex of nine different viruses that do this. Um, you might have two of them, you might have all of them, you might have one of them. Uh, you can test for these things at different plant laboratories. But the difference here, the main one that I use is that the veins stay green. So in a white variety with red blotch and with leaf roll, you're going to get, instead of red leaf tissue, you're going to get kind of a yellowish, kind of looks like it, it's nutrient deficient leaf tissue. But if the veins are green, then this most likely is going to be leaf roll. Um, and that was part of why we didn't catch red blotch to start with. Uh, a lot of people thought, that, oh, this is just a different type of leaf roll. We should look at it and test for that. And they didn't find anything uh, until someone identified it as a separate virus. The so leaf roll, red blotch, they fooled the experts for many, many years. Um, so it's hard to tell in the field. But if you look at the veins, you can kind of tell which one it is. This also limits sugar acc accumulation. And it is vectored by mealybugs, which we have plenty of all over the place. And I'll talk about mealybugs in a bit. The other virus that's of importance, I would say, is fan leaf virus. This can deform and discolor your leaves. So not only this, this pretty mosaic of you know, uh, necrosis, um, but it also deforms the leaves. So you get kind of a weird shaped leaf that doesn't look like it developed right. It prevents berry development as well. And it can result in shot berries. So shot berries are berries that never get past uh, the fertilization stage. So they they are fertilized by themselves, they form a berry, and then they just don't develop any further than that. They don't grow, they don't change color. Those are shot berries. And those make your yields go way, way, way down. Um, so fan leaf itself can reduce your yield significantly. Uh, it's problematic and it can be hard, pretty hard to identify when you're looking for nutrients or viruses or just trying to figure out what the cause is of these issues. Um, this prevents, oh, sorry. This is vectored by dagger nematodes, which are also hard to see. They're everywhere, they're in the soil, uh, but dagger nematodes will vector these and they're just little roundworms nematodes. And then the only bacterial disease I really want you to know about is Pierce's disease. This is a bacterial infection that lives in the xylem of grapevines. So this image in the top right here, these are bacteria living in the xylem of a grapevine. Um, so what they do is they, go there 
and they can clog the vascular system, preventing water flow from different xylem vessels. So the water won't go up this one vessel when this bacteria grows enough to clog it completely. And that results in stunted shoots, uh, reduces your yield over time. Basically, if you don't have water going to the right places, then those places aren't going to grow. Um, over time, it will kill the grapevine entirely, and it has wiped out entire vineyard areas of California before. So three times in the past hundred years in the Southern California grape growing tradition, um, mostly the flagship example is Temecula, wiped out a huge percentage, a majority of the vineyards um, in Southern California. And it's vectored by sharpshooters, which are, are alate or jumping flying um, insects that can pass it on from one grapevine to another. Here's some symptoms of what they may look like uh, when you don't have an electron microscope to really take a look at the examples. So this is another one to watch out for. But a really important thing to do to avoid all of these, if you notice all of the things I've talked about in terms of viruses and bacteria uh, are all vectored by some insect or roundworm. So what we wanna do is we wanna look for common insect pests and vectors in the vineyard. This is very important. The two, two of the big ones that are really common everywhere in California are sharpshooters and leafhoppers, which look similar uh, and can be hard to differentiate, especially if you have a smaller sharpshooter that you're looking at, um, but they have different impacts on grapevine. So the sharpshooters that are of grave importance are glassy wing sharpshooters. Uh, glassy wing sharpshooters are not yet established in the North Coast. We have something that looks very similar to them, uh, but we do not have glassy wing sharpshooter. And that's great because glassy wing sharpshooter is too good at transmitting Pierce's disease, the, the bacterium responsible for Pierce's disease. In the San Joaquin Valley in Southern California, they have these everywhere and they, they are very good at transmitting disease. Up here, we have blue green sharpshooter is probably the most um, ardent offender of uh, Pierce's disease. So we are looking for blue green sharpshooters, which you can look at a picture of. They look basically like this, but they're bluish green in color and they're smaller. Um, Leafhoppers, while looking very similar to sharpshooters, uh, they mostly damage grapevines by feeding directly on the leaves, causing loss of foliage. Um, and the big one that we have up here that are concerning are the Virginia creeper leafhopper because they, re they reproduce so quickly and they build up such high numbers that we have a hard time controlling them, particularly in organic situations where they use products that work, but um, generally have to be applied at high volumes in order to control leafhoppers. Mealybugs, mealybugs are also a vector. They vector leaf roll viruses. Uh, they can be found um, by following ants, which sounds strange. If you have ants in your vineyard, and this is something I learned from our IPM advisor, Cindy Cron, ants don't eat anything on grapes. They don't typically chew on tissues. They don't what they do is they farm the mealybugs. They follow the mealybugs around. They protect them from predators. And they eat the honeydew that they produce out of their bodies uh, as a source of sugar. So if you have ants in your vineyard, particularly on the trellis lines, um, follow them. And you can probably find out where you have mealybugs. They, mealybugs, because they make that sugary ex excrement from themselves, the honeydew, they can also promote the growth of sooty mold, which is also problematic for grapevines, another mold, right? Um, and in our region, vine mealybugs are most problematic and very difficult to tell apart from grape mealybugs. Uh, but there are, if you bring it to an expert, they can identify the difference. Nematodes are both vectors and plant feeding insect pests of grapevines. Um, there are many different kinds of nematodes <clears throat> that do different damage. Dagger nematodes are the nematodes that vector family virus uh, by feeding on roots, root tips in particular. Uh, and they are also one of the biggest, ne bigger nematodes in, that are, cause agricultural damage. Um, top right there is what a dagger nematode kind of looks like. You know, you don't see all the organs and stuff typically, but you can see them. You can see them under a standard microscope. And the other types of nematodes really look out for are root knot nematodes, which cause this kind of damage. They basically destroy the root system, not allowing it to grow much more where they have impacted it. Citrus nematodes, ring nematodes, and lesion nematodes are also problematic, but these two in particular are very problematic, dagger and root knot. And then weeds. 
the final category. A weed is just an unwanted plant. Um, they could be anything. Sometimes they are really detrimental, but generally they don't have any, uh, you know, specific damage directly to grapevines. They're just there. They're using resources uh, and people don't want them there. Um, sometimes they're desirable on one farm and not on another. We have to look out for those. Um, but they can also be great benefits in, in terms of correcting soil structure or improving soil organic content. So when you're looking at pests and diseases, you should ask yourself a handful of questions. What tissues are impacted? How old are the grapevines that display the symptoms? How long have the symptoms been there? What does the spatter pattern of spread look like? That's very important to determine what the source cause is. And how do your neighbors have a similar problem? Um, or do your neighbors have a similar problem? The, spatter the pattern of spread really matters because things that travel by flying insects can hop from one place to another. Um, where things that spread slowly in the soil or between vines directly tend to spread in a circular pattern. Um, what tissues are impacted? This is important to figure out what kind of pathogen you have. Uh, if it's this, this is a trunk disease. It's a wedge-shaped discoloration in the trunk. That is a trunk disease. It's a classic sign. Um, you should look at things like the trunk, any permanent wood. So if you have a cordon, the cordon, any foliar tissue, um, fruits, roots, pretty much every part of the vine and see which tissues are most impacted. Many pathogens will infect more than one tissue type, but are more apparent on a specific type of tissue, which helps you identify them. And that pat pattern of spread, I keep saying spattern, that pattern of spread is very important, uh, again, because we can help figure out where that infection is coming from and where it's how it's spreading. So for instance, this one up top, uh, is spreading in a circular pattern. So it's most likely being spread either directly between vines uh, or by something that does not fly uh, or is in the soil because it can't travel very far very quickly. The bottom one here, however, looks like it's being spread by a flying insect vector of some kind because it's hopping from one place to another and completely skipping a good swath of grapevines. So we have to think about that when we're looking at disease patterns. Pests are changing uh, based on climate change as well. The host pathogen interaction uh, is very important. It's widely understood that abiotic stresses can influence the outcome of host pathogen interactions um, in plant ending either the great, greater resistance of the plant to the pathogen or more frequently in enhanced susceptibility. So we're seeing uh, abiotic factors that might be involved in triggering some of these diseases, especially foliar sy systems. Uh, symptoms lately rather than in the past 20, 30 years. A great example would be fungal trunk disease symptoms, which we have seen more in the North Coast in the past, uh, especially last year after we got several years of drought, uh, followed by a pretty decent rain event during winter. And that really kick-started or, or increased the amount of um, fungal pathogen symptoms that I saw in vineyards personally. So kind of allegorical, but I did get quite a few reports the year, last year after the big rains. Um, so the, the host pathogen interaction really is also impacted by the climate. And part of the reason for that is that grapevines don't really have a natural, the same kind of immune system we have. Um, they have an additive immune system. So that means that when something is causing them strife, they create some kind of compound to deal with that. That takes resources. So if it is extreme heat or damage from frost event, they have to figure out what do I have to do to fix this damage? Uh, and they use resources to do that. If you stack issues on top of each other, like say you have drought and then now you have Pierce's disease or Xylella fastidiosa, you have to figure out, the vine has to figure out which defense compound is more important to synthesize uh, and it'll prioritize that. So sometimes it gets more susceptible to uh, the second stressor after the first one is already established. So we have to think about stacking or um, collaborative stressors as well. One great example of this, uh, this phenomenon of diseases adapting to climate change is Pierce's disease, Xylella fastidiosa. Uh, typically we don't worry about it in the North Coast or historically because the bacteria will die off during winter temperatures below 53 degrees for a prolonged period. It needs a certain amount of days below that temperature to die off. It can't handle the cold. 
traditionally, there are strains that can, but the one that really causes issues, we it dies off. But we get warmer winter temperatures now than we used to, or there are there's a trend toward that. So we there is a reduced uh, effect of overwinter recovery now on Xylella fastidiosa, which means more Pierce's disease in our vineyards. The winter temperatures in California have increased about two degrees Fahrenheit since the 70s, and that makes it uh, Xylella fastidia much more likely to survive the winter, unfortunately. We also have new diseases in vineyards, and I put new in quotation marks for a reason. Um, sometimes they're difficult to identify and they've just been there a long time. A great example of that is Lyme disease on the West Coast, uh, which is human related, right? But Lyme disease was very common on the East Coast. And then when it started showing up on the West Coast, a lot of doctors, from what I've heard, said, oh, no, it's probably something else. But it was Lyme disease and it wasn't identified because it had never been there before. That's a problem. And that's something that is that does happen in agriculture, too. Um, red blotch virus in vineyards happen this way as well. So again, I mentioned before that uh, a lot of researchers and um, viticulturalists thought red blotch was uh, leaf roll viruses. However, it was identified as a separate virus in 2008. So for the entire time it existed before that, we thought it was something else, just like Lyme disease. Um, so we have to be wary for these new diseases or just the migration of diseases from other places or pests. Uh, and on that note, pests are moving northward, right? Uh, most things are moving northward. If you've ever seen the prediction of redwood stands, uh, they are predicted to move northward by quite a bit in the next hundred years. Uh, and that has to do with temperature increases. Um, so the migration of insects and pathogens is expected to move northward and even toward the coast in some cases. Uh, and that has to do with higher temperatures. So say this line was originally its range, well, now we have warmer temperatures, so the range will increase to the north, and the pathogen or pest can also move north along with the limit to their, their growth, like so. Um, so we have to think about that. So another question for you to think about. What do you think is going to become the biggest challenge for grape growings, for growing grapes in our changing climates? Not just in the north coast, but overall. Um, think about the biggest one, and then think about how you might try to overcome that challenge. Just, you know, give it a thought. Uh, you can type your answers in the chat or just keep it to yourself and bring it to me at another time. And I don't have time for more questions yet, but I'm gonna keep, gonna finish this off. So best management practices for small vineyards. This is kind of the summary of what we've been talking about. Monitoring is key. Anybody that manages vineyards will say, if you don't know what's going on, then you can't do anything about it. Um, and you want to use consistent monitoring techniques so that you can compare observations from the past to observations today. These are all very important. Um, some examples to keep track of would be like water demands of the site. Uh, how much water is lost? How much are you replacing? And what is that doing to your yields? Um, phenological development of the grapevines or what, at what time of year are they hitting specific stages of development? That will change with climate change. Uh, signs or symptoms of pests and diseases. This one is the key monitoring approach. Make sure you watch out for pests and diseases constantly. Uh, and this is true for any agricultural system. Um, local weather conditions, extreme weather events, and then the functionality of your infrastructure. Do you have a damaged irrigation line? Well, you should probably fix that before you have a frost event. Adaptation is also very important. I know this is a general concept, but uh, we should be willing to try out new practices and plant new varieties of grapes. There's a wide range of traits out there that we could we could use, but we have been underutilizing in real world vineyards. Um, so we should try and see what is out there and if it can help us with our changing climate. Um, on top of that, new technologies and methods, they're being developed all the time and a lot of them just get thrown to the side. Uh, they should be identified and they should be used in the field to see if they're actually functional. <clears throat> and one of the things I wanted to bring up that I always bring up in my talks is that we are limiting uh, our ability to adapt by just selecting for a handful of varieties to grow. And this has to do with market limitations. So if you know the consumers are going to buy Chardonnay, more people are going to plant Chardonnay than any of the other white varieties. But we're bottlenecking down quite a bit to two varieties here. Chardonnay and Cabernet, they, re they represent approximately 40% of the entire acreage of wine grapes planted in California. That's a huge amount of acreage for just two varieties. 
And that limits our ability to adapt to climate changes uh, based on what these two can do, where we have hundreds of other varieties we could see are good at late bud break to avoid frost, or maybe they have a more moderate vigor than these two in order to decrease water demand. Or maybe they have early fruit maturity to avoid uh, autumn frost. These things are out there and we just need to find a way to grow them and make them profitable um, in the market rather than just stick to two varieties. This is also true for rootstocks. I didn't really get into rootstocks, but they're what we use as the medium between the soil and the grapevine that produces the fruit we want. Um, rootstocks are very similar trend where there's you know five of them that make up about 80% of the market uh, for grapevines sold in California. Uh, this data is really hard to get. So th these are our California rootstocks basically. Um, again, they have huge adaptable uh, ability to them and there are uh, hundreds of them again to choose from. Um, we need to be willing to try out different rootstocks as well. So what does a climate adaptive vineyard look like um, when you're managing it? There are some goals that I'd like to highlight here. So water use efficiency is a big one as we are in a state that has pretty consistent drought. Um, we would look at drought tolerant cultivars or better technologies and methods to improve our water use source, uh, resource efficiency. Heat drought tolerant varieties in the same vein uh, would fit under water use efficiency as well, but we need to find varieties that can tolerate the higher temperatures that we're having and we need to adopt them. We need to actually plant them. Um, we also need pest tolerant rootstocks as climates change, insects will become different. The interactions of insects and pests will be, with grapevines will become different. So we need to identify those future risks that we expect to see. We need to research them and test them, and then we need to put them in the field as well. And that's true for, for grapevine scions as well, the upper part that produces the fruit. That's also very important to do. We need to improve our, our management practices to increase efficiency. Um, that means maybe precision irrigation. So that instead of watering uh, based on the total loss in, of water in the vineyard, maybe we do it based on a specific block or we do it based on a specific row. Or if we can even get it down to a single grapevine, that would be great. Um, that seems unrealistic based on how we grow grapes right now, but we could get it down to a single block level relatively easy. And there's a lot of people that do. Um, we could also optimize our canopy design in order to decrease the amount of resource usage that we need, for instance, natural shading, so we don't lose as much uh, fruit to heat and sun damage. Um, improving our soil health, there's that word again, that could mean a lot of things. And any one of the factors that are involved in soil health would be great to improve it to some degree. So that means water infiltration, just how much water when it rains actually goes in the soil. That's really important. It also helps with erosion. Water retention, how much of that water is lost versus stays right around the root zone. Um, nutrient retention goes very closely with water retention and then promote the health of other organisms in the soil too. So not, not just mycorrhizae, even though they are very important, uh, but what other organisms are out there that in the soil that we want to keep. Um, one that people look over a lot is employment, making it more desirable to work in vineyards. Uh, making the jobs themselves de desirable and maybe not making people work out in 100 degrees for too long, right? Improve your, this will improve your employee retention as well as keep skilled labor in the vineyard. People that know what they're doing and know a lot about the site will stay there. We need to monitor. I, that was one of the ones I started out with. We need to look for new issues. Uh, we need to record those issues, observe them and find any patterns or trends that occur uh, over long periods of time so we can address them properly. Um, and then we can get ahead of those challenges before they become really expensive. And again, I would say these are, a lot of these are true for most agriculture. Um, and then the hardest one I think is the ready adoption of new practices because it's so expensive to grow grapes and the margins can't, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Um, we need to have growers that are willing to try out new concepts and new practices and new techniques to increase our climate resiliency as a whole. So the people that can do it, I would very much encourage to do so. I, I gave you some homework, you don't have to do it. Um, knowing what you know now, really go through the primary objectives that we looked at before 
for vineyard management and choose your top three for prioritizing in your vineyard or your imaginary vineyard. And why would you prioritize those? And based on those, how would you focus your climate adaptive vineyard management strategies? Like I said before, our management practices change on our goals. So what are your three big goals and how would that prioritize what strategies you could use in your vineyard? And a quick summary, and I will have a couple time, couple minutes for questions. So um, overall, our objective in the vineyard for management is to improve vine health, to improve the longevity of the vines and the reproductive efficacy so we can be sustainable. Um, typically, you do that through modifications or management of the vines and the conditions on site. Um, there are other ways, other inputs that you can look at, like uh, sourcing your composts from an affordable place or a high quality place, that kind of stuff also matters. Climate change is really important for stress and it can increase abiotic stress. So from anything inorganic, from heat to wind to rain, um, from these extreme weather events, which cause acute damage. Uh, and then that leads to biotic stress increases from pests or just impacts the pest directly, uh, which can then indirectly affect the grapevine. Um, and then if we're thinking about management, we have to think about how our vineyards are going to be climate adaptive in the future, because if you, we manage the same way we always have, uh, we're going to have some issues. Um, so the a climate adaptive vineyard of tomorrow has to take into account economic, environmental, and social effects that climate change may have on agriculture uh, to really make informed decisions that help ensure sustainability of an operation uh, or improve the operation to the point where you can uh, expand to some degree. Those would be my main points from this talk, I would say. I'm going to say thank you, and then I'm going to leave it on this page where you can find uh, this presentation and pretty much every other presentation I've ever done, um, and I'm going to answer a couple questions. So let me start. Let's see. So... Ooh, I just answered that one. Okay. Let me just start with one of the earlier ones. Um, during sugar development, would you still not water the vines on days or weeks above 100 Fahrenheit? It's a great question. Uh, that's going to depend if you are, if you're worried about heat damage and, from resulting in berry shriveling. If you're late in the season, like during harvest or right before harvest, uh, you do want to irrigate those vines because they will shrivel and they will become raisins. Um, if you're in the middle of the season and the grapes haven't even hit raisin yet, so they're still green, you don't really have to think about that as much because the grapevine should have enough resources uh, to deal with that and not enough uh, sinks or, or fruit to really worry about it that much. So yes, uh, yes and no. You, you would want to water them in cases where you're close to harvest. You don't need to really think about it as much when you are still in early stages of grape development. Um, and yes, I will copy the chat and try and answer all of the questions later uh, if I, since I will not be able to get to all of them. So let me keep going. Do you remove wood? or leaves in the vineyard after winter pruning? Yes, yes, you should. Uh, because a lot of the times you don't know um, what is what is infected. So if the infection might be there, it just may not be visible. Uh, so yes, you would want to remove any tissue uh, from the grape, from the vineyard if possible. Or if you're planning on tilling it into the ground, that is okay too, as long as it's not directly in contact with the grapevine as it grows next year. Okay. How can you manage bricks development? My cab vines have a tough time getting into 24 even through the heat of Vacaville. That's a great question too. I think uh, that might have to do with, the, my guess would be there might be some virus or something in there. Grape vines should never be red in, in autumn when they lose their leaves. The leaves should always be yellow when they fall off, no matter the variety, with the exception of tinturiers, which most people don't grow. Um, I would think maybe if you have a hard time getting to 24 bricks in Vacaville, you might want to consider doing a virus test. Uh, that's not common in that region. And I already clarified reapply potassium. What, do you, what are your thoughts on rototilling 
the soil at the base of the plant to allow for better penetration of granular fertiliza fertilization. Um, unless you have poor infiltration rate at the base of the vine, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, in the majority of vineyards that I've done water infiltration testing in, uh, the, the soil at the base of the vine is actually much more prone to absorb water than in the middle of the rows. Um, so really, we, we don't really mess with the soil right underneath the grapevines, unless you're doing weed management um, using organic methods. So like uh, a Clemens radius XL with a finger hoe, that would be something that you would do. But tilling actually can upset the, um, the aggregate structure of the grape of the soil. Uh, and if you already have bad, good infiltration rate, there's no point in doing that. If it's bad, then you could do it. Uh, and then I would recommend planting cover crops after you do it underneath the grapevine um, that will die off before summer comes. What is a small farm hack for the wind tower? I don't know what you mean. Uh, I would say that with the wind towers or the wind machines, the most important thing to do is make sure you have an inversion layer first. And you can do that by putting up a tall tower uh, with a temperature logger at 30 feet and a temperature logger at five feet. And if the difference is more than a couple degrees at evening time, then uh, you could probably use a wind tower. Okay, let's, I got time for one more and I will try and answer these later um, and maybe add them to the slides. All right, last question. I know that in Portugal, which has a similar climate to California, dry farming grapes has been legally mandated for centuries. Do you know what they do what do they do that's different from uh, what we do to make that possible? Is it less dense, dense planting or letting vines get older with better root systems or something else entirely? It might be the soil types. That's a really big thing. Um, in California, just within California itself, dry farming is much more successful on specific soil types. And for us in the North Coast, that is the Gold Ridge series is the best for dry farming. Typically, you need a well infiltrated upper layer of soil. Uh, followed by a clay hard pan. So you're basically making a cup that holds the water and keeps it from going too deep in the soil. The other issue is that dry farming requires um, that you start dry farming. If you want dry farm, want to have a dry farm vineyard, you should have a dry farm from the beginning. That allows the root system to grow deep enough to reach water sources that are deeper down. If you irrigate it all, the grapevine's going to say, there's enough water at the surface. Why would I grow my roots 20 feet deep? Um, it might be that they just have that method for establishment of dry farming grapes more down pat than we do as well. Uh, but my guess would be it has a lot to do with the soils as well. And I think I'm going to call it there because this is my time. I uh, thank you all for coming very much. And I will uh, look at these last few questions and try and answer them uh, in some way, possibly on my website. So thank you again. Uh, and yes, uh, if we do have red vines, on any normal wine grape, that is, I would remove those. Yes, um, that that is a virus. Okay, hand it back over to Evan. Thank you very much, Christopher. We hope to see you guys at the next workshop.